Hey, welcome back to Timers Part 2. Um, I was thinking about something over the break. Um, one of the easiest ways to differentiate the on delay and off delay is if you think about the off delay. Uh, as soon as the coil is energized, the contacts change state, just like that, just like a control relay. And it does its time and business on the tail end, okay? And it doesn't start until that control, until the timing, uh, the timer is de-energized. So, you, like I said, it acts a lot like a, a control relay. As soon as you energize the contacts, switch state, and it waits to do its business on the tail end, okay? Uh, after the timer has been de-energized. With the on delay, it does the exact opposite. Uh, it, as soon as you energize the contact, uh, the, the timer, excuse me, as soon as you energize the timer, the contacts are going to hang out for the elapsed amount of time, and then they'll switch state. And they'll stay switched until we de-energize the timer, and then it resets and goes back. Um, it just, I had to stop thinking about that. I, I remember when I was uh, starting out my career, it, it was hard for me to get my head around this, and this was before PLC timers uh, were really as prevalent as they are now. But anyway, uh, I had to deal with, some, deal with some mechanical ones like this, so uh, it, I just thought that might help you a little bit. We're going to move forward now and talk, start talking about the three different types of uh, timers. We're going to spend the most time on the motor-driven timer. This is this timer right here. Um, most of the time, it's uh, panel-mounted, meaning that the, it's in the door of your control cabinet. Uh, and again, we, we, we want that because we want the operator to be able to adjust the time process uh, without having to call somebody or pull out a laptop or any, any you know, involved process of, of changing the time. It uses a synchronous motor and a clutch. That's going to be kind of critical here. Uh, it uses a synchronous motor and a clutch in order to actuate normally open and normally closed contacts. Okay? Now, it also has, not only does it have the time contacts, but it also has instantaneous contacts, meaning that they work a lot like the control relay contacts. As soon as you energize the timer, these instantaneous contacts will change. They are unaffected by the time process. Okay? They, are, they are unaffected by the timing process. So they only switch states when the timer is turned on and off. Okay, so uh, they're, again, they're, they have no delay, uh, whether on delay or off delay. They're just instantaneous, but they, are, they do play a role in this. Again, this is the front face and, and the panel, easy to, this is a 10 second timer, a uh, little, little indicator light letting you know that the timing process is in, in, in play. Um, whenever you have to replace one of these things, there's usually some type of a locking screw here, and just give it a quarter turn or so, maybe half turn, and you can pull the whole unit out and the whole unit is housed inside this, this housing right here, this black casing right here. And once you pull it out, you'll, there's a, this is not quite the same type, but this shows you the mechanisms. This has got the, it's got cam loads uh, on these, uh, mounted on the motor shaft, and you've got limit switches down here that these cams will roll over, and uh, they're being driven by the motor while it's running. We're going to get a little further detail on this, this shortly. But what these cams are rotating as the motor is, is energized and turned, and they'll come down and hit these uh, actuators on these limit switches, the, these little micro switches right here, and they'll roll on and then they'll roll off of them and open and close. So you've got three sets of switches, three sets of cams with lobes on them. So that, that, those are what open and close uh, the contacts, and they're all inside. The nice thing about this is that once you've wired it up, you don't have to unwire it to replace it if the timer goes bad. You don't have to unwire anything. You just slide it out of that housing uh, and you slide it right back in. And there's prongs, uh, male, female type configuration with prongs in the back for each one of these screw terminals that your conductors are going to be hooked to. So it just slides right in there, you know, e e easy. It just, it just runs with it, okay? Uh, again, this is the mechanism. You've got a wire, You've got a couple of wires that, that run the motor in the clutch. Uh, and these cams rotate on the shaft, opening and closing, depending on uh, when these lobes actually come in contact with the operators of the switch, okay? Now again, I said that um, we've got instantaneous contacts and we've got time contacts. The instantaneous, instantaneous contacts are controlled by the clutch, okay? So when we energize the timer, two things are energized, okay? The clutch and the motor that turns the shaft that then turns the uh, cam wheels, okay? So we have the instantaneous contact. So if we were to energize this uh, timer, uh, for example, and these are the these these numbers right here are the connection points, right there. Okay. So that's what these represent right here. So if we have an instantaneous set of contacts, uh, we'll have like the nine and the six will be our common point between these two sets. And if, if say we had power 
uh, going on number nine, it would be going through uh, to this terminal in the C. And as soon as we energize the timer, the clutch will energize and we switch these instantaneous contacts and we go from 9C to 910. And this will be uh, six, I'm not sure the number on that one, uh, I think six, seven, and it goes to six, eight, okay? So these, these uh, actuate immediately with the uh, clutch solenoid, okay? That's the solenoid symbol for the clutch. And these are the time contacts right here. Now these are the ones that are gonna be on delayed or off delayed, depending on, on the type of timer. Uh, and you've got that motor um, that's, that's, that's turning and we energize that motor and that motor shaft starts to turn. And again, those timing, those uh, cam wheels are on there and the, the lobes will come over here and hit these, uh, these uh, contacts and, and open and, and close them, okay? Uh, this is kind of a little bit more involved uh, it's, it is a little bit more uh, difficult to understand, but what I'm going to do here is, uh, for example, you can I hope you can see this on the screen here. We've got a, a coil symbol. That, remember the coil symbol is the little squiggly, uh, like a transformer coil uh, or uh, a control relay coil, but um, we, we put our power here to number one, and then we put it back here to number 12, and we put power, that powers the clutch and the motor. You'll notice know, that the 12 will make its way to the motor. Okay, and this is the neutral for the motor. It's also the neutral for the clutch coil. Okay, they share that common point right there. So number, terminal number two is our uh, neutral point. So we're gonna put power on these two and, and we're gonna energize the motor. And also, you remember the light, the, the little green light there on the front of that, right there, that light is also being energized when the motor is. So we need power going to here, energizing the motor, going to our neutral, well, this black, connection point uh, is going to give us a feed to our light, green light, while it's being energized. So when the green light's on, we know that the motor's running. They're running uh, in parallel, okay? And again, here's our contacts over here, all right? And once the clutch coil is energized, notice the dotted line, the mechanical linkage over here. We're going to be pulling these contacts open and closed on this side over here, the uh, 9, C, and 10, and the 6, 7, and 8. Here's your... Um, Here's your 9C and your 10, this one set of contacts are normally closed. And when the, when the clutch energizes, this will shift down and we, get, uh, we break that 9C connection and then we get a 910 connection, okay? Normally open, but uh, we'll then close. There's another set doing the exact same thing, okay, up, up here. We got a uh, common point right here that feeds a normally closed set of contacts. That clutch energizes. This bar drops down, we lose our 6-7 contact. Now we have a 6-8 established, okay, as a result of that. And these are not timed, these are not timed, these are instantaneous. Use those for different functions in our process, okay? These are the uh, time set of contacts, okay? And I've got one more slide here that kind of gives us an idea of, you know, again, we uh, provide power, let's say we turn a limit switch on, or we could hit a push button regardless, you know, just some type of device to feed power to one, and then we're going, actually we're going into 11, I said 12 earlier, it's the same route, okay, because this normally closed set. But we energize those two at the same time, okay. Um, and then that makes the, uh, again, again, I identify the clutch coil. Um, this is an example of, um, <clears throat> I hope you can, I hope we can see this all the way. Uh, this is an example of how this timer would work, okay. I found this, uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, we got a conveyor motor that's running these conveyors, and these are sand bowls right here. And this is a, a dumping station where they dump molten iron into each one of the sand bowls. Uh, we got to park one of the sand bowls under the dumping station um, and allow it to fill. And then once it's filled, uh, after a certain amount of time, we give it a certain amount of time to fill, and then we will start the conveyor and move the next um, sand bowl under there. So here's how we're going to do that. First of all, before we, have a, before we have a sand mold under our filling station, we're running along here, and we've got uh, power going to our timer, okay? And it's going through uh, terminals uh, four or five, okay, normally closed. We're not doing anything right now, it's normally closed. And then we're routing it through six, seven, and connection point, and it makes the motor starter run, okay? It turns that motor starter on, to turn the drive motor on so we can continue to move until we get to a sand mold. Now, once the sand mold is up under there, a, a sensor uh, limit switch um, is uh, actuated because it sees the sand mold, okay, it's, it's detected. So it makes that limit switch. A couple of things happen. Number one, 
the timer clutch uh, energizes. And remember, we said that instantaneous, con instantaneous contacts change just like that. So we've got our instantaneous ones right up here. So where we were feeding the, the power here, uh, we are now going to break it with this set right here, six and seven is feeding the conveyor motor. We're gonna break that because we've, we've energized the clutch. And now six and seven is gonna be broken. And now we have a com uh, con connection between six and eight. With six and eight, we energize our filling solenoid, our solenoid that will allow the material to fill in there. We've also broken this circuit to our conveyor. So our two things are happening at one time as a result of that clutch being energized. Uh, we have stopped the conveyor in its tracks, but, and then we have opened the filling solenoid, okay? We are gonna give it a certain amount of time to fill up, okay? And then after, uh, after it's filled up, we're gonna allow it to start again. So our time contacts, our, our, the time, timer motor is also energized because it's in parallel with the time clutch, uh, and then we are going to start that motor. That's our, that's our time contacts at work for us here. So, after um, a certain amount of time, we're going to uh, close these contacts back, okay? And then, the, or these contacts will shift, and then um, after they, it's had time to fill up the station or to fill up the mold, this set of contacts is going to time open, and this is going to time close, and we're going to start our conveyor motor moving out. But at the same time, at the same time, we're going to lose our power going to our uh, solenoid through here because remember we were going from here and 6 8 to our solenoid well now we, we're going to open that up with the time contacts as well so it's going to shut the solenoid off so we quit dumping material and at the same time it's going to flip up here and we're going to start our conveyor motor again um, I don't expect you to remember any of this or, it's, or memorize this this right here what I'm trying to illustrate to you though is that um, you've got time contacts uh, and instantaneous contacts that are working together uh, and, and what's in this, you know, as far as uh, the clutch and the, and the motor, how they work together a little bit. Um, and just give you an application, okay? I could stand up here and talk about timers all day long, but I'd kind of like to give you an application every chance I get to. Uh, get to. But that's how the, the mechanical timer works. Um, it is a little bit more complex, um, particularly when you see the other timers I'm fixing to introduce you to. Uh, it's more complex, more wiring. Uh, it's more, a little more antiquated. Uh, but it is really robust. Um, it's, it's pretty stout uh, in industrial environments. Okay? The next time where I want to talk to you about, and we're going to be kind of moving through this, the rest of this rather quickly, uh, is a dash pot or a pneumatic timer. And that's the one I showed you earlier. Um, it's this one right here. Okay? Um, this uses a bellows, a lot like an accordion bellows. Okay? Uh, and it fills with air. And you adjust the amount of air going into the bellows with a needle valve, okay? You are metering that amount of air going into the bellows, and I've got a good picture uh, for you to show you too. Uh, but that, that meters the rate at which the air enters the bellows and is allowed to expand. Of course, when it, once it expands all the way, a set of contacts are made, all right? So there's mechanical contacts set uh, hooked to this bellows as it um, opens and closes, okay? Um, you can physically attach uh, a dash pot timer or pneumatic timer to a control relay, okay? Um, or you can have a standalone with a coil by itself. This one, the Siemens uh, that, that you're going to be working with has an A1 and an A2 coil uh, connection, uh, connection points here uh, so that you energize that timer like we were talking about earlier. And here are your contacts. You're normally open and you're normally closed. And then you've got uh, a little uh, screw right here. And this is the screw that's going to be metering the air in and out of that bellows. So let's take a look at this, okay? First of all, this is the kind that mounts on the front of a control relay. Here's your control relay, like, you, like you've worked with um, in 1401, okay? Uh, here's the basic control relay. What we've done is we've screwed this timing unit onto the uh, bay, or onto this uh, control relay. Now when we energize the coil, all right, we put 120 volts on our coil, we pull that armature in, well, we're also pulling the uh, bellows closed, okay? at the same time. So there's a mechanical linkage between these two right here. So, uh, and the armatures are connected so that you, there's just one armature and it connects uh, for the uh, contacts here like it always does. And now it's also controlling the uh, bellows uh, on, on the timer part of it, okay? Um, this is the Siemens I showed you a minute ago. Here's the, here's the image I wanna show you. So when we, um, when we energize our coil, what we do is 
we, uh, we, the armature pulls this uh, spring good, opposes the spring, and it closes this bellows. Now all the air that's in there, uh, just the static air that's sitting in there, it will come out of this check valve, okay? Because the check valve will allow it to blow out, but it will not let it suck back in, okay? Because there's a ball valve, that, uh, or a little ball that keeps it from um, sucking back in. You should know this from your pneumatics and your hydraulics, okay? It's like a check valve, so it is a check valve. And so it blows it out one way, and it won't let it come through the other way. What we're doing is we're letting it come back in this way. So we've, in, we've energized the coil of our timer, Okay, we compress this, all right, and expelled all the air out of it. Now the spring, the spring is trying to push this bellows this way. Notice we've got a set of contacts right here too, so that when we um, energize the coil, we pull the bellows, and then we close this set of contacts. Now, the amount of time these contacts stay closed is based on how quickly we let air rush back into the bellows and uh, let the spring pressure take over the, the basically like the vacuum that's created right here. When we energize it, we expel all the air, and we cut somewhat of a vacuum. We adjust this little uh, needle valve screw, uh, and it allows, uh, we, can, we can meter how much air is allowed to, to uh, return back into the bellows, and the spring pressure will continue to push it back, but only after it's overcome the vacuum, and we're, we're kind of bleeding that vacuum off with our air inlet uh, screw here, our needle valve. On the one for the Siemens, uh, it's really quite simple uh, if you think about it. Uh, with the Siemens, our needle valve right here is this adjustment screw right here, and you'll get a chance to play with this in the lab. But that's what you're doing when you're setting the time on this pneumatic timer. You are literally adjusting how much uh, uh, passageway you're allowing the air to pass through by, by closing it off or opening it up. Okay. So the more time that you put on a timer, basically you are closing this air off. Okay, more and more. If you want the timer to be short, you back it off, let the air get in there really fast, and then it closes much faster. Our contacts open up or close. In this particular case, we're just we're, we're opening contacts after uh, we have uh, after we have uh, actuated. But this is, I mean, this is really quite simple. Um, it's kind of cool concept, I think. Uh, but uh, again, uh, it can be either actuated with a coil or uh, on its own, standalone on its own, or it can be uh, put on. Um, a control relay. The one for the Siemens, it's, it's got its coils A1, A2, so we're going to have to put power right here in order to get it to actuate. Okay? Now, the other type of timer that we're going to talk about um, is the solid state. Okay? We've got one here, um, similar to this one here in my image here. This is the uh, solid state timer that you're going to be working. This is a multifunction timer. It's got time on, time off delay. It's got a uh, uh, re repetitive timer. It's got you know, just a lot of different features. Um, but uh, uh, this is electronic, there's no real working on it, there's no contacts to replace or anything like that. Um, it's got a dial here that allows us to, to, to set the amount of time. It's even got a, a, a range setting, so you can set this timer from uh, 0.1 seconds to one, uh, to one minute. Uh, you can go one minute to ten minutes. Uh, six minutes to, to 60 minutes so you can change the range and then adjust the time within that range with the dial okay there's your range setting and then, and then after you've set the range it's going to be you can adjust the time of this dial within that range a lot of different functions in this timer uh, I don't really want to get too too much of that um, for 1501 because like I said earlier uh, PLCs have taken over the timing world you know basically to do all the different multifunctions but uh, there are still some simple operations out there that use the, uh, use the uh, solid state timer. Um, they, these can range from very simple, very cheap and expensive to more complex and more expensive. Um, there's the basic re resistive capacitive type timer and there's the CMOS which is basically a chip on a board. Um, some have the thumb wheels or dials like I was showing you and you've got your range adjustments. Um, uh, they're, they're, fairly, they're fairly simple. Um, you can wire it. The, the, the way you can adjust some of these there that don't have the dials on the front, this one, this one is just a, a, a CMOS type uh, timer. This one has the dial adjustment. This one has no dial adjustment. So what you have to do is you have to hook some type of potentiometer and vary the voltage going into uh, the uh, timer. And that varied voltage will it varies the time uh, that, that you're going to uh, get out of this timer. So you might have a potentiometer on the outside of your panel. Uh, easy to adjust, you know, don't have to open the panel doors. It'll be wired to this module here in your control cabinet 
and it's varying the voltage going to the timer, and then, like I said, that varies the amount of time. You got more expensive ones, more uh, more in depth, more program. There's programmable type timers. You got your keypads that you you know you can you can tell them to turn on and off, delay. You know, program just different things. These also uh, substitute as counters as well, uh, but you know they're more expensive. Um, and again, and just unless you got a super simple operation that you don't need a PLC, uh, I would use PLCs for just about anything you know, it's timing related. And this is what we're going to now. Uh, you'll get into this if you take, you're going, we're going to get into this in, if you take uh, 2701, which is part of the degree requirement uh, for the program, but we're going to get into timers. These timers here are just extremely accurate, I mean down to the thousands, in the, um, in the uh, Control Logix 5000 PLCs, they're down to the, ten, to the uh, thousands of a second that you can get them to, uh, to uh, that, that, that type of accuracy. Um, there's, there's, these are virtual timers, so um, as we put in the software, so there is no hardware, there's no physical timer. These are all uh, virtual and they're in the PLC memory. And you can have hundreds and hundreds of these things and never take up an ounce of cabinet space because it's all in, inside the PLC. Uh, these are extremely accurate um, and there's nothing to wear out or break. Okay? These right here, heat is going to get the electronics on these. The mechanical or motor driven timer, the motor is going to burn up. Uh, you're going to have contact wearing out, things like that. Pneumatic timers, going to, you're going to have the same problem. You're going to have bellows issues. So these are virtual, nothing to wear out, nothing to break. I mean, they're just, when you get into PLCs, you'll understand what I'm talking about. That concludes our timers. That's a lot of material, kind of in a short amount of time. Uh, you're going to get your hands on them, uh, and you'll see. And then also the lab has a wiring project that you're going to have to wire up the timer and a couple other uh, automatic input devices. So be prepared for that. I put all that material online, so prep and look at it ahead of time. Save yourself some time in the lab. Um, to bring me any questions that you've got regarding that. Again, this is Timers. Um, if you have any questions about them at all, uh, look me up and we'll answer your questions. Other than that, uh, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got something out of it and we will see you in the lab.